Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Ian Plant, Managing Editor of Outdoor Photography Guide. For those of you who don't know me, I've been a professional photographer for 12 years, and I travel the world looking for exciting scenes and subjects to photograph. And I've partnered with Outdoor Photography Guide, a site dedicated to teaching you how to make great landscape, wildlife, and travel photos to bring you this, our first live event. Uh, it's going to be the first in what I hope will be a regular series that will give uh, me a chance to answer your questions about the art of photography. Now, as I said, this is our first event, so things are a little bit basic. Unfortunately, for the next hour, you've got to stare at me, uh, which is not a pretty sight, I'm sure. But in the future, we're going to hope to make this a bit more dynamic and interactive. And so hopefully, uh, in future events, we'll uh, be able to show uh, photographs and uh, processing tips during the live event, but for this event, we're going to have things pretty basic. I'm going to answer some questions that we've uh, received from folks, and during the event, people can ask questions as well. I won't be able to get to everyone's questions. I'm going to try to pick the ones that I think are the best, that are the most relevant, that are going to be uh, better for me to convey to you some of the tips and techniques that I use in my landscape photography. So I apologize in advance if your question goes unanswered. Before we start, I just wanted to make a few quick announcements. Uh, first of all, remember to follow the Outdoor Photography Guide uh, page on their Facebook page. You can also join their uh, Facebook community, which is a great place where people share ide uh, ideas and techniques, and they also post photos for critique from members of the community. So it's a really great place if you want to connect with some other uh, passionate, interested, and enthusiastic photographers. And uh, information on uh, these links will be uh, updated on the page that you're on now. So uh, in a few minutes, you'll probably see those links pop up. You can also sign up for the OPG newsletter. And if you haven't already done so, you should consider downloading a, a copy of my free ebook, Essential. And you should see a download banner under the video player on this page that you're looking at right now. Also, we have uh, just a quick announcement. We have a coupon code set up for everyone. The code, li the code LIVE40 will allow you to get 40% off until June 2nd for a few of my uh, recent books on landscape photography, including my Focusing for Landscape Photography bundle, which is an ebook and a video, uh, Ultra Wide Landscape Photography bundle, and also my ebook, The Grand Landscape. So that's LIVE40, and that'll give you 40% uh, off of these uh, very helpful ebooks. And uh, I'm going to answer some of the questions are going to be topics that are discussed in these ebooks and videos, but these ebooks and videos go into much greater depth uh, on all these topics, much greater depth than I'll be able to go into here. So, once again, thank you everyone for participating in this live event. Uh, we've received a lot of questions, including many that are along the lines of the following, and this question is pretty basic. Uh, but we've seen a lot of people submit this question, which is, what makes a good landscape photo? And this is a, a fantastic question. It's actually a question that I'm constantly asking myself. I wrestle with this. The, I've spent the past 12 years uh, consumed by this very question day and night, trying to figure out what it, it takes to make a great landscape photo. And a lot of this is uh, subjective. A lot of this is, I know it when I see it. Uh, it, you're trying to capture something ephemeral, some mood, some moment, uh, and it's very difficult to convey in a, in a short presentation how to do that. But there are five basic elements, five objective elements that I tend to look for when I'm making a landscape photo. So these five basic elements, not every landscape photo has to have all five of these elements, but I think it's important to think about these elements when you're looking to make a landscape photo. So the first element is having a compelling sky. The best landscape photos, they're really not typically taken on a day where you have blue skies. The tourists love those days, but they're not necessarily great for compelling landscape photography. I like to have a lot of clouds, a lot of drama in the sky. So that's really the first thing that I'm looking for with any landscape photo that I'm shooting. Uh, the second thing is favorable color and light. Uh, don't expect to get a lot of sleep if you're looking to make powerful, compelling landscape photos. Twilight, sunrise, and sunset are typically the best times to get that really stunning light. You know, think of beautiful sunrises and sunsets and the otherworldly colors of twilight. These are the times you want to be out there shooting to make great landscape photos. You can make good photos during the middle of the day when the light's not as favorable. There certainly are opportunities for that, but you're going to find that the, day, the times of day at the edge of light are going to be your bread and butter when you're trying to make landscape photos. 
Of course, uh, having dramatic background scenery is also very important for landscape photography. Uh, it's not always critical. I mean, a lot of times you might be working with an intimate detail of the landscape, uh, and sometimes you might be working with a relatively subtle background. If you've got really compelling skies, for example, you can make a, a shot without a bunch of mountains sticking up in the background or something like that. But more often than not, I'm looking for something really interesting, something really dramatic as my background scenery that is going to elevate my landscape shots uh, to the next level. Another uh, key element of landscape photography is having sharp near-far focus, having basically uh, really sharp focus from the closest object in your scene to the farthest object away. Ever since the days of Ansel Adams landscape photography as a genre has been dominated by this sharp focus throughout the image frame and there is certainly room to be creative with focus with landscape photography but your classic landscape photo has sharp focus throughout and we'll we'll be discussing that a little bit during this uh, presentation today. And then finally the fifth element and to me this is in so many ways, the most critical element of landscape photography is to have an interesting, compelling, and ultimately leading foreground, a foreground object or element that is going to draw the viewer's eye deeper into the scene. I like to tell people that with landscape photography, it's really your foreground that's the most important part of the, uh, the photo. Everything else is built around that really great foreground. So I spend a lot of time looking for that compelling photo uh, for that compelling foreground that's going to lead the, the viewer's eye deeper into the scene when I'm making landscape photos. So, as I said, while not every great landscape photo has all of these elements, I think it's a good idea to keep these in mind when you're out there looking for landscape scenes that you want to photograph. And, um, and, you know, look for a way to bring these five elements together, and if you can, you're going to have a successful shot. As I answer the questions that we've got, I'm going to go into each of these elements in greater detail. So without further ado, I suggest we roll up our sleeves and dive right in. Uh, I have uh, my assistant here, Lilia, today, who is going to be reading some of the questions that people pre-submitted. And she's also going to be reading questions that people submit during the live event. And as I said, I'm not going to be able to get to everyone's questions, but I'm going to try to answer the most interesting ones and the ones that are going to allow me to teach you what I consider to be the best techniques for landscape photography. All right, our first question is, how do you determine the best location and time where you should take your photos from if you haven't been there previously? What do you look for in a potential location? And how do you scout out a location for a compelling photo? Scouting is extremely critical to landscape photography because what you really need to do is find interesting compositions. And I mentioned before uh, finding those great foregrounds, especially if you can find a good foreground that's juxtaposed with a compelling background. So what I like to do when I go to a new area, uh, one, one thing I'll sometimes do is do some online research, first of all. I, I don't really want to see what other photographers have done in this area because I don't want their artistic vision to... Uh, infect my personal vision, but I do like to go and do a Google Images search, and usually what that pulls up is is a lot of photos of an area taken by people who are just taking snapshots, amateur shots, uh, you know, people who are hiking through the area instead of other professional photographers or serious photographers' images. And that way I can just get a feel for what the scenery looks like, and I might study a map. Sometimes I'll consult hiking guidebooks uh, because they often have information on areas that might sound interesting. And then once I've got a general idea of the places I might want to explore, the first thing I do when I reach a new area is I might spend some time driving around if, if there are good roads there and it's a large area. So I might drive around just to see what I see from the road that might look interesting. And uh, there's, a, there's a tradition in landscape photography. A good friend of mine calls it roadkill photography. A lot of photographers will take pictures only of what they see close to the road. I know some one photographer who's bragged to me that he's never gone more than 100 feet from his car to take pictures, and that, that's certainly a, a great way of doing things. Uh, and there's a lot of photos that I discover just by driving around and exploring areas. But what I like to do is when I see uh, an area that looks interesting, I like to get out of the car and hike around, walk around, and really hunt for compelling foregrounds that are juxtaposed against a dramatic background. And, you know, this is where, you know, basically driving around uh, gets me in the ballpark. And then by getting out and exploring with my two feet, then I start to refine the compositional possibilities. And, and when I find interesting compositions, I might identify three or four or five in a particular small area. Because when I go back there for sunrise or sunset, 
I, I want to have some options because ultimately where the clouds are in the sky and which clouds light up in the sky may determine what compositions I think will work best for that particular lighting situation. So if I have three or four potential compositions within close proximity, that way when the light does progress during sunrise or sunset or twilight, I've got options. I can pick the one that's going to work best with the light. And I, I, you know, a lot of photographers will use apps like Photographer's Ephemeris to get an idea where the sun's going to rise and set, uh, or maybe you know, celestial features like the moon or the Milky Way in planning their shots. And I do, I do use Photographer's Ephemeris to try to figure out where the light is going to be. But I also I like to be uh, fluid and I like to be reactive to what's going on in, in real conditions. So even though I, I might know where the sun is going to set, for example, I don't necessarily plan a shot based solely on that. What I do is I've just got an idea in my mind, okay, I, I've got this composition that I like, I've got this foreground that really works nice and there's a good background here, and I know the sun's going to be setting over here, uh, but I'm going to just be there on location when the light is good and we'll see what happens with the clouds, where the clouds light up in the sky, because at the end of the day I might find that, that all my planning is for naught and I have to very quickly react to conditions on the ground. Uh, and change my whole composition and outlook. So the key thing about scouting is just to spend as much time as you can identifying interesting features. Uh, I call it the hunt for cool things. So I'm looking for interesting and compelling foreground features that I think could work for a composition. And then I just wait to see how conditions unfold. And if it all comes together, that's great. I get the shot I want. Uh, sometimes I have to go back to a location multiple times to get the shot I want. Uh, you've, you've identified a great composition, but you just don't quite get the light to work for you, so you have to go back several times until the sky lights up the right way, the clouds are in the right position to bring the whole thing together. All right, our next question is, how do you put feeling into your images? Wow, that's a, that's a great question, and it's a very difficult one to answer, but I'll try to take a quick stab at it. Uh, I think that photography is interesting and unique among art forms because there's a tether to reality. You're capturing, you're really looking to capture unique moments when you're a photographer. And I think that finding interesting compositions, you know, is obviously an important part of landscape photography. But, but a great composition without that special sauce of the unique moment on top uh, isn't going to quite give you that feeling and that magic that you want. So I'm, I'm really waiting for those compelling moments. And with landscape photography, those moments almost always happen when there's interesting weather. So I'm waiting for beautiful clouds in the sky that will light up at sunrise or sunset and, and give you that special ingredient for your, your landscape compositions, or moments maybe when light is breaking through mist or fog and you're getting sunbeams and things like that. These weather events are what can transform your basic landscape scene into something magical. So. More often than not, weather plays a key role in my attempt to convey feeling in my landscape photographs. And more specifically, it's moisture. Uh, on a dry, sunny day, you tend not to get much in the way of interesting weather. But when you have a, a front moving in where there's a lot of moisture, either it being a storm front or maybe a cool front that has more moist air, that's when you get the interesting things. That's when you get those dramatic storm clouds that can light up. That's when you get uh, rainbows and lightning or maybe fog in the morning or things like that. So I'm waiting for those special moisture events to give my photos that little something extra. All right, the next one is a bit long here. With the improvement of HDR processing and the huge dynamic range of modern digital cameras, do you think that the graduated neutral density filters are now redundant in landscape photography? Uh, that, that's a great question. Uh, the technology definitely is improving. Uh, the dynamic range of cameras today far exceeds that of uh, film for those people who were using film back in the day. And with a lot of scenes, you can capture simultaneously all the tones from the brightest tones to the darkest tones in a single photograph. And that certainly makes it less necessary to use a graduated neutral density filter. For those of you who aren't familiar with the graduated neutral density, density filter. It's basically a, a filter that's darker on one half and light on the bottom. And you pull this filter down, you pull that dark half down over the, um, the horizon so that, for example, if you're photographing a bright, colorful sky and your foreground is in shadow, you can balance the exposure of the scene. And graduated neutral density fold, uh, filters used to be absolutely critical to landscape photography work, but uh, now the increased dynamic range of cameras make them
uh, less necessary than they used to. And a lot of photographers like to use exposure blending, where they take an exposure that properly exposes the brightest parts of the image, and then they take another exposure to properly expose the darkest part of the image, and then using a computer, they blend those two images together. They might use a dedicated HDR or high dynamic range imaging program, or they might just hand blend those on Photoshop. Uh, I don't really use graduated filters that often anymore because I, I tend to use uh, computer blending to do uh, that, that same thing, to accomplish that same goal, which is basically squishing the dynamic range of the scene into something that the camera sensor can handle. I think that blending in Photoshop in particular, if you know how to do it, uh, can give you a much more natural look. The problem with pulling a grad filter down to your horizon is that if you've got anything sticking up over the horizon, like trees or mountains, those will go dark as well. So you're not just darkening the sky, you're also darkening anything sticking up uh, beyond the grad transition line. And that would uh, lend a somewhat unnatural look. And also the grad filtration could look a little too heavy. It's hard to get it just right so that you have the proper balance with your exposure. So if you're hand blending uh, exposures in Photoshop, uh, you can make it, make it look much more natural if you want. So I prefer to do that if I can. But certain scenes, it can be really, really difficult to successfully blend your images, even if you're using a simple HDR program. One particular scene I'm thinking about is if you're working in a coastal environment and you may have a lot of moving water uh, and if you're trying to blend multiple exposures, you're going to have all these moving elements that are different from exposure to exposure and that increases the complexity of the blending significantly. So there are still a few types of scenes where I prefer to use a grad if I can, but the truth of the matter is I like most landscape photographers these days, uh, tend not to use grads as much as we used to in the past. All right, and we have a live submitted question from David asking, any post-processing tricks to make fog pop out in images? Um, so yeah, that's a real uh, good question. Um, I think you want to be careful when you're processing fog images because you know, one thing you can do to make the fog seemingly pop out more is to increase the clarity or the contrast of your image, but in doing so, you may be reducing the softness, the diffuse light of a foggy scene. So if you try to make the fog pop out too much, it starts looking less and less like a foggy scene. So I think you have to be very, very careful when you're working with foggy scenes. Part of the magic of foggy scenes is the fact that the light is diffuse and softer. If you increase the contrast too much with a foggy scene, it won't look like it's foggy anymore. So I tend, instead of trying to make that fog pop out more, uh, when I'm working with a foggy scene, I, I tend to just try to keep it, you know, having that low contrast, soft, diffused look. All right. Can you explain your metering process for a scene? I'd be particularly interested in how you do it when using a graduated neutral density filter, if that's part of your workflow. So I, I get asked this question a lot when I'm giving presentations at photo conferences or photo clubs. You know, how do you, how do you meter a scene? I get asked if I'm spot metering. And I, I usually just kind of laugh when I get this question because my metering process is pretty simple. Uh, I pull up my image in Live View and I turn on the, uh, the Live View histogram. And if uh, the scene falls within the, the histogram, uh, then I go ahead and take the shot. And if there is contrast that exceeds the ability of the camera to record the image. So for example, if, uh, if part of the histogram is clipped, either the highlights are too bright or the shadows are too dark, then I think about using a grad filter uh, or doing exposure blending. So it's actually a quite, quite a simple process. Uh, I think a lot of folks might have heard the expression exposed to the right. And the idea behind this is that when you're making an exposure, you want to push your histogram as far to the right of the histogram graph as possible without overexposing any of your highlights. And the reason why you do this is because digital files, there's a lot more data and detail in the bright parts of the image than in the shadow parts. So if you have a lot of, uh, of your histogram bunched up to the left, which is where the shadow parts of your image are represented on the histogram graph, then you've got a lot of, you've got a lot of the, the image detail in areas of the image file where there's not a lot of data. And the reason why that's bad is that when you don't have a lot of data, uh, that's when you can get digital noise. So if you try to brighten those dark areas, you're going to see that noise pop out and that destroys image quality. So when you push the histogram as far to the right as possible, you have a cleaner 
sharper, higher quality image file. And when you do this, when you take an image that's exposed to the right, you have to be very, very careful not to overexpose any of the highlights. You don't want, you don't want that spike on the right side, the very right side of the image graph, of the histogram graph, because that represents highlight areas that have been dramatically overexposed. And you can't recover the detail of a highlight that's been clipped like that. So it ends up just looking pure, right. if, pure white. If you try to recover that detail, it just looks gray. So you want to be careful to avoid overexposing your highlights with some scenes. For example, if you're shooting into the sun and the sun is part of your shot, it's going to be overexposed no matter what you do. So if it's only a small element of the overall composition and you've got some of your highlights clipped, it's not a big deal. But you do want to make sure that any important highlights in the scene are clipped. So for example, if you're photographing a scene with a, a brilliant, colorful sunset sky, you want to make sure you have detail in that sky. If that sky is clipped and overexposed, you won't be able to recover that detail. So when you shoot to the right with a lot of scenes, you'll find that the image file, to your eye at least, when you pulled up on your camera LCD or when you bring the file back on your computer, it might look a little washed out. It might look too bright. Uh, it might look, quote unquote, uh, overexposed. You, you know, as long as you haven't clipped any of the highlights, you're okay. Because you can pull that exposure back while you're processing the image file and you can bring those highlight areas to a correct exposure. So exposing to the right is always a good idea. And this is great if you can avoid clipping your highlights and you still have detail in your shadows. But if you find that there's no way to simultaneously capture detail in the shadow areas and detail in the highlight areas, then you've got to think about using a grad to balance your exposure or exposure blending. All right, I have a 10 stop neutral density filter. What are the best conditions to best utilize this filter? So a neutral density filter is basically just a, 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 a gray filter that you put over your lens. It's designed to block light coming into the camera and without changing the color. And a 10 stop filter is a really heavy gray filter. It, you know, you put it up to your eye, you can barely see through it. And so that's blocking a lot of light. So each stop means that to get the same exposure. So if, you're, if you set up a, a shot uh, and your exposure time is one second, uh, each stop of that neutral density filter means you have to double your exposure. So if I put a 10 stop filter on, that one second exposure has to be doubled 10 times. So I'm terrible at math, I'm not gonna run through it, but you get the idea. That one second exposure will become a very, very long exposure with a 10 stop neutral density filter. So one second will go to two seconds, that's one stop. Uh, two seconds will go to four seconds, four seconds will go to eight seconds, eight to 16 seconds, 16 to 30, I mean, I'll round it down to 30 seconds, you know, one minute and so on. Um, so when you're working with a 10 stop filter, uh, it's not really designed for low light situations. What it's designed for typically is when you're shooting uh, in the middle of the day, for example, when it's really bright out and you've got a lot of light and you need to cut down on the the light coming in because you want a long exposure effect. So neutral density filters, they don't really do you any good if you're photographing a scene where nothing's moving, but let's say you want to photo photograph a waterfall in the middle of the day and you want that silky smooth water effect. It's probably too bright during the middle of the day to get that effect, so you use the 10 stop neutral density filter and that'll allow you to get that longer exposure with the water. It can also be useful when you're on the shore, on the coast, and there's a lot of water moving, you can get an exposure that might be several minutes long and you can get uh, the water to completely blur so you get that foggy look to your coastal scenes. Uh, it's particularly useful if you've got clouds that are moving in the sky overhead. So once again, even if you're shooting in the middle of the day, you put that 10 stop filter on and you might end up with an exposure that's several minutes long and the clouds will blur across the sky. So a neutral density filter is what you want to use when you want to experiment with long exposure effects. You've got to make sure you have significant parts of the scene that are moving to make it work. And for the most part, uh, a grad that, uh, sorry, a neutral density filter that heavy is only going to be useful during the, the middle of the day. If you, if you are shooting with a 10 stop grad around sunrise or sunset, you may end up with some very, very long exposures which can be uh, really nice if you, know, if you want to do a three to five minute long exposure at sunset and get the, the clouds, the colorful clouds streaking across the sky, you can get some really great effects.
All right, and we've got sort of a series of questions here because we've received a lot of comments about how to get sharp focus from a foreground all the way to the background, so we'll read some of those. The first one here is, how do you obtain sharp focus throughout the photo without resorting to advanced techniques like focus stacking? I know that we can increase the depth of field by narrowing the aperture, but that does not guarantee focus. Please explain a foolproof method foolproof method of obtaining front-to-back sharpness in landscape photography. Well, if I had a foolproof method uh, for getting uh, a near-sharp focus, uh, then I would be a millionaire right now. Unfortunately, there are no uh, foolproof methods. Uh, I do have some methods that will help you get there. Uh, so, so basically, as I said earlier, one of the, the key elements of, of classical landscape photography is sharp focus from near to far. And the way you achieve this, uh, and I'll get into focus stacking later, but uh, the question was how do we do this without focus stacking, uh, is you need to use a small aperture to increase what's known as your depth of field. And this is an extremely complicated topic, all this stuff. I, I just you know, did a book and video combo uh, focusing for landscape photography. If you really want to learn more about this, I recommend you get that because I think that'll really help you uh, learn everything you need to know about it. But to basically summarize, depth of field is what controls how far the zone of sharp focus or the zone of apparent focus is in a scene beyond the focus point. So when you focus your camera, you're focusing really on only one point or more appropriately a focal plane, uh, which is parallel to your camera. And uh, anything that's in front of or behind that focal point, that focal plane is technically out of focus, though the appearance of defocus uh, basically diminish it, it, so it, when you're very, very close to the focus point, something might still look like it's in focus, even though it might be a little bit out of focus. And the farther you get away from the focus point, in front of or behind the focus point, that, that appearance of sharpness will gradually diminish until something looks like it's out of focus. So what depth of field does is it extends that zone of apparent sharp focus around the focal point. So when you use a smaller aperture, you increase your depth of field. You increase that zone of sharp focus. So if you're shooting wide open with a big aperture like f2.8 and f4, and I know this is counterintuitive that, that the f, like f2.8 is considered a big aperture even though it's a small number. Uh, it's because it's a fraction. So that, you know, if, if you know math, you can understand why it works out. Just for, you know, for sake of ease, I'm going to say that f2.8 is a very big aperture. So it's a big opening that lets in a lot of light but that means you also have a very narrow depth of field. So to get a lot of depth of field, you need to stop down and use a smaller aperture like f11 or f16 or f22. That will extend your zone of focus uh, so that more of the scene looks like it's in sharp focus. Now, the simple answer might be shoot everything at f22 because that'll give you the maximum amount of depth of field, uh, but this answer isn't really terribly helpful for two reasons. First of all, you get something known as diffraction. Diffraction is an optical effect that when you use a very, very small aperture, you start degrading overall image sharpness. So even though you might have more of the scene that looks like it's in sharp focus, you're diminishing the overall, the maximum sharpness so that the image looks a little soft. Everything will look like it's in focus, but it just won't look as crisp as it might otherwise have been if you used a smaller aperture that's not limited by diffraction. And the second reason why shooting at f22 isn't satisfactory, is that some scenes have such extreme near-far elements that even at f22 you can't get everything in focus. Uh, and the third reason why shooting everything at f22 isn't satisfactory is that the zone of focus extends beyond your focus point. If you shoot everything at f22 but you don't put your focus point in the right place, that zone of apparent sharpness that spreads out from the focus point might still not hit everything in your scene that you want to have in focus. So you need to learn how to use the smaller apertures to extend your depth of field, but you also need to learn where to focus. And I think the next question uh, in this list was, what's hyperfocal distance? Uh, and so I'm going to jump ahead to that. Hyperfocal distance is where you focus your lens to optimize your range of focus, your depth of field. So if you just focus on your background, for example, you're wasting a lot of that depth of field in the foreground. And if you're focusing just on your foreground, you're wasting a lot of depth of field in the background. So you want to focus at somewhere that's in between your foreground, your nearest foreground element, and the background that's far away. So um, 
you know, one rule of thumb that floats around out there is focus one third into your scene. And uh, I, I tell people to ignore that one. It doesn't really make any sense. I mean, if you're photographing a clump of flowers that's three feet away from you and the scene extends to a background mountain that's five feet away from you, what's one third of the scene? one third between three feet and five miles, well that, that doesn't really make much sense. You certainly don't want to be focusing at a point that's a mile or two away. Some people say, well you just go up from the bottom of the image frame to something that's one third of the way up from the bottom of the image frame and focus there. And, and that might get you in the ballpark if you're working with a flat plane subject like a, like a uh, you know, a cracked mud floor in, in the desert or something like that. But if you've got, let's say, flowers sticking up and they stick up halfway into the scene, if you focus on those foreground flowers, you know, that would be the point you'd focus on if you go from the bottom up one third, you focus on those flowers. Well, you you focus too close because you're focusing on your immediate foreground. So that one third rule doesn't really make much sense. It doesn't really work. Uh, I don't think it's helpful. What I tell, tell people is that what you need to do is estimate the distance from your camera to the closest foreground element that you want in focus. So in this example, that clump of flowers is in your foreground. It's approximately three feet away from your camera. What I tell people is that you double that distance and focus on a point that's twice as far away from your foreground object. That will be more or less the hyperfocal point that will optimize near far focus in your scene. So those flowers three feet away, focus on something six feet away instead and then stop down to a small aperture like f11 or f16 to get everything in focus from near to far. Now this is very, very complex. Uh, as I said, I wrote a, a whole book on it and did a video. I, I strongly recommend if you want to learn more about all this stuff in a way that, that makes sense because I guarantee most people are wondering what I'm talking about right now. I recommend you check out that book. Use that, that code LIVE40 to get 40% off and everything will be explained in great detail and I think it'll be a lot simpler for people because this is arguably the most difficult thing for people to learn about landscape photography. So if, if you're looking for a quote-unquote foolproof way to make sure everything is in focus from near to far, you may want to consider doing something called focus stacking which is taking a series of photos of exposures of the same scene at the same exposure. All you're doing is changing your focus point so that you have a bunch of different photos that are all taken at the focus points that are represented by your entire scene. So you focus on the closest element in your scene and then you incrementally move back until you get to the background of the scene so that pretty much everything in the scene has been focused on almost directly. Then what you do is you blend those images together. Uh, you can blend them in Photoshop. Uh, you can use a focus stacking program like Helicon Focus, which is what I use. And that way you end up with a photo that's very sharply focused from near to far. And the focus stacking allows you to do several things. Uh, one, it allows you to work with scenes where you have extreme depth of field requirements. Like if you're focusing on something that's very, very close, maybe inches away from your camera and you want to have sharp focus all the way out to infinity. Um, these are scenes that you can't photograph using depth of field and hyperfocal distance alone. Uh, so focus stacking allows you to get past those technical limitations of the camera. Focus stacking also allows you to, to avoid diffraction. So you can use optimal apertures like f8 or f11 where a lens, for most lenses, they'll be at their sharpest from center to corner when you stop down to about f8 or f11. And this is before diffraction starts kicking in. So you can focus stack a scene using that optimal aperture and that will enhance the overall sharpness of your image. So I, I will use focus stacking a lot, even if I technically don't need it, uh, even if I can get everything in focus using hyperfocal distance and depth of field, I might still focus stack, blend together three different uh, images focused at three different points, just because it'll give me a sharper overall image. It'll, be, it'll have higher image quality. So focus stacking, I think, can be very useful. Uh, where focus stacking gets tricky, and this is why it's not a, a foolproof method, is that, once again, not unlike with uh, graduated neutral density filters versus exposure blending, if you're working with a scene where there's a lot of moving elements, the focus stacking can get tricky because you're trying to blend a bunch of exposures that are taken at different points in time. Even if you're, you're shooting through the focus stack relatively quickly, there might still be a one or a two or a five second delay between each of the exposures you're taking and blending stuff that's moved around during that time 
can often be very, very difficult. And of course, focus stacking gets extremely complicated if you're also exposure blending at the same time. So a lot of times when I've got a really complex scene, instead of focus stacking, I will rely, I think probably 90% of my shots, I rely on just good old fashioned hyperfocal distance and depth of field, and I don't use focus stacking nearly as much uh, because I'm often working with complex scenes where there's a lot of moving elements where I have to be really careful about the exposure and I'm trying to capture some magical moment. So I think it's important to learn how to do hyperfocal distance and uh, depth of field the old fashioned way, uh, but to have focus stacking as a, uh, an arrow in your quiver. What are some do's and don'ts about having people in your landscape shots and what's the best way to pose them? Should there be more than one? Uh, so I, uh, you know, for the longest time when I was taking nature photos, I didn't want to show people at all. I didn't want the hand of man in my photographs at all. Uh, and I think a lot of uh, people who focus on nature photography feel that way. Though I, I've learned over the years uh, and I've come to embrace having uh, people in the landscape. It can, it can be a real interesting element. It's often said that adding a person in the landscape gives the landscape a sense of scale. And I think there's some truth to that, but of course your choice of lens uh, and your relative position is going to determine uh, you know, the scale that is in the scene more than anything. So if you're, if you're far away with a wide angle lens from a person in a, in a broad scene, they might look really tiny in that scene. But if you get very close to that person, they might look larger than the background subjects. So I, I don't really think that you know, a person necessarily adds an element of scale or it might be misleading in terms of the scale that it provides but it's certainly something to think about. More often than not, it's not really scale that I'm going for when I have a person in, the, uh, in my landscape shot. What I'm looking to do is to make a more interesting composition. And some landscape scenes, uh, they just really don't come together that well, but if you, add, if you add a person to the composition, the whole thing comes together. It provides a strong focal point, uh, and, it, and it gives you more elements that you can use to create a dynamic composition. So if a scene calls for it, I will add a person to the scene. Usually that person is me because I'm out there alone. And so I'll use a, a timer or a remote uh, on my camera. Like I like to use the, the Wi-Fi on my camera to uh, trigger the, the shutter using uh, an app. Like for my Canon cameras, I use Camera Connect. And that way I can stand in the scene, I can position myself the way I want, and then I can trigger the shutter whenever I'm ready to take the shot. So in terms of posing people, how many people you want in the scene, it's entirely up to you. You know, as I said, I do a lot of shots where I, where I only have one person as an element in the scene, but certainly having more than one person can make uh, the composition more dynamic. You've got to be careful not to make it too chaotic. So I think this is really a subjective choice, uh, so I don't have any hard and fast rules regarding that. In terms of, of posing, uh, I'm always thinking about the composition, and what you want to do if you're posing someone in the landscape is you want to avoid it looking like uh, a snapshot. So you don't want just someone there looking at the camera smiling back. I don't think that's particularly compelling or interesting. What you want to do is you want to incorporate that person into the overall composition in a way that seems natural. I think, I think adding the person can add a sense of place. So it's usually best to have that person looking out into the scene um, or maybe striking a, a pose or a shape that complements other shapes in the scene. So. I don't always have a person looking out. Sometimes I'll have a person looking up uh, or doing something more dynamic with, the, with their, their line of sight because that becomes a compositional element. Uh, but I think generally the one thing you want to avoid is having that snapshot pose where the person's just looking at the camera and smiling. So um, when they're looking into the scene somehow, I think that's much more compelling. When do you use a polarizer? And do you recommend the use of polarizing filters with a wide angle lens? So a, a polarizer has a very specific function. A polarizer filter is designed to remove or enhance reflections. Uh, the more traditional use is to remove reflections. So I'll start with that first. So when you have a polarizer, the polarizer spins on front of your camera. As you spin the polarizer, you'll see that reflections in the scene will disappear as you spin it. And then as you keep spinning it, the reflections will reappear. So you just keep spinning it until those reflections go away. So the time you would want to use a polarizer is when reflections in the scene aren't contributing to your overall composition. One classic uh, standard example of this is if you're photographing a waterfall or a stream or a, fo or a forest scene. When there's a lot of 
wet rocks and foliage, for example, anything that's wet is going to be highly reflective. And so if you're photographing a waterfall on a cloudy day, the wet rocks are reflecting basically light coming from the clouds. So you get all this, this gray glare on those wet surfaces. And the polarizer allows you to eliminate that glare and that will enha enhance contrast in the scene. It can also enhance color. So if you're dealing with foliage, for example, that's wet, it might be really shiny and reflecting a lot of that glare, you get rid of the glare and the native color of the foliage, say it's uh, uh, you know, the middle of spring or uh, when you have beautiful fall foliage, the polarizer gets rid of that glare and allows that color to come through so you can, you can saturate the colors better. So that typically is the only time that I will use a polarizer to enhance contrast and color in a scene. There are some other times I would use a polarizer when I want to enhance a reflection. So uh, a good example of this is when you're photographing a rainbow. Now, if you put the polarizer on and you spin the polarizer, the rainbow will disappear. But if you keep spinning it, you're going to see that rainbow appear to come out much more strong and colorful. And you're not, at that point, you're not really polarizing the rainbow because if you polarize the rainbow, it goes away. And a, a, a rainbow is, is similar to a reflection. It's a refraction in the sky, but kind of the same principle. Uh, I, I'm not you know, an expert in physics, so I probably stated that wrong. But in any event, when you polarize a rainbow, it'll disappear. But if you move it away from that full polarized position, you'll see that rainbow will seem to pop out. And what you're doing there is you're polarizing the background. So that makes that reflection in the sky, that rainbow, pop out more, makes its colors look stronger. Same thing, for example, let's say you're photographing uh, a stream on uh, a bright sunny day and there's fall foliage in the background that's reflecting in the water. So when I'm photographing a scene like that, getting all the interesting patterns and colors in the water, I'll often use the polarizer to see if I can bring out those reflections, to enhance the reflections by polarizing some of the wet surfaces around the reflection. So there are times when I'll use a polarizer to enhance reflections rather than remove them. Uh, one other use that people have had in the past for a polarizer is you use it to darken a blue sky. So, you know, blue sky operates kind of like a rainbow. Uh, that blue is a, a refraction in the sky or something like that. And so when you spin the polarizer, you can actually make that blue sky look a lot darker. And if you've got big puffy white clouds against that blue sky, they really pop out. It enhances the contrast in the scene. You want to be careful when doing this, though. Because if you're using a wide angle lens, you'll get uneven polarization in the sky. So a polarizer works best at a 90 degree angle from the light source. And when you're working with a wide angle lens, you, you have such a wide field of view that as you're spinning the polarizers, parts of your scene are farther away from the light source than others. So you get uneven polarization. And this is most obvious when you're working with a blue sky and trying to darken the sky. In situations like that, I don't use a polarizer because that uneven polarization does not look good. If you want to darken that blue sky, you can do that in processing, like in Lightroom or Photoshop, where you select the blues and you, you selectively darken those tones. Now, I don't worry about uneven polarization with a wide-angle lens when I'm shooting waterfalls, uh, because even if parts of the scene don't polarize as much as other parts of the scene, still getting most of the scene to polarize and pulling away that glare is very helpful. If you're working with a really wide angle of view uh, for a waterfall scene, you might have to compromise and choose uh, a polarized position that removes the glare in the most important parts of the scene. But remember, if you're working on a, a cloudy day, um, you know, as I said, the polarization is greatest 90 degrees away from the light source. With a cloudy day, the whole sky basically is a light source because the clouds are diffusing the sunlight. And so that removes some of the concerns you might have if you're using a polarizer on a sunny day to polarize the sky uh, because the, you know, the, the sky is the entire light source. So uh, you're, you're, you're basically going to be able to get good polarization even with a wide angle lens for most of your scene on a cloudy day. All right, and before I read the next question here, I'm going to remind the viewers that you can continue to ask questions live by using the comment box on the page. So keep submitting those. And our next question is, so Ian, you've taken a lot of volcano photos. How do you get so close to the lava flows? OK, so um, I think this question is about some of my recent shots from Hawaii, uh, where there are surface flows of lava uh, that you can actually get close to. Um, and um, in some places, you, you know, you, when they have these surface flows in, in the national park, people can just walk right up to them. 
Uh, and uh, for the photos I took, there weren't any surface flows active in the National Park. The week before I was there, I had people telling me that there were surface, surface flows all over the National Park, but those had kind of dried up. So when I was there, um, there were surface flows, but outside the park on private land, so I hired a guide to take me to these places. And uh, you can get you know, very, very close to the, uh, the lava. Uh, you know, people like to go in and maybe roast marshmallows over the lava there. So it's, uh, it's quite a stunning thing being that close to the lava. And uh, when the lava is a surface flow like that on, uh, on ground that's not very steep, it's moving slowly. So it's, it's uh, easy to outwalk, to outrun. It's, it's not like one of those serial killer movies where no matter how fast you run, the serial killer is still walking right behind you. Uh, it's easy to get away from a, a surface flow of lava pretty quickly. So it's relatively safe. Nonetheless, you still want to take Precautions. You want to you want to be careful when you're working near lava. It's nice to have a spotter or a guide who can pull you back from a place that's dangerous. And the lava is really really hot. So I was I was working close with an ultra wide angle lens. I was at 11 millimeters with the lava, and the heat coming off the lava was enough to uh, singe my forearms just a little bit. It looked like a bad sunburn. And uh, my tripod was getting so hot that I couldn't pick it up and hold it. I had to. Uh, push it back and forth like a hot potato after I picked it up. So I, you know, if I go back there, I'm going to wear a long sleeve shirt and a pair of gloves to help uh, cut back on the heat a little bit. Of course, you don't have to get as close as I did. I would not recommend, you know, this is one of those things, folks, don't try this at home. Uh, I tend to take a, a bit more risk than the average person because I do this for a living uh, and I'm also used to doing dangerous things in the wild. It's just part of my job description. And I, I try to very hard to make it as safe as possible. I don't like taking unnecessary risks. Uh, but for, you know, for someone who's not comfortable getting that close to lava, you can always step back and zoom in a bit. You don't have to work at 11 millimeters with an extreme ultra-wide perspective. You can still get great shots with a 24 millimeter lens or a 35 millimeter lens. So this is one of those things, as I said, it's pretty common for people to get very close to these lava flows. Uh, there, there is some danger, but it's, uh, it's easily minimized. Just be careful and uh, don't push outside of your comfort zone and wear appropriate clothing so that you don't singe yourself and I think you'd be okay. All right, and we have a pretty specific question here submitted live from David. Have you ever shot a solar eclipse and will you be shooting the upcoming eclipse on August 21st? And do you think there is any particular scenery that works well with eclipses? Uh, that, that's, that is a great question that has actually been occupying my thoughts considerably for the past few months because I saw the news reports about the solar eclipse. I have never photographed a solar eclipse. I've photographed lunar eclipses before, but that's a whole different uh, can of wax. So uh, the solar eclipse, um, first of all, uh, the best place to photograph the upcoming solar eclipse will be in the United States. And there is a narrow band of totality. Totality is when the, uh, the sun is completely behind the moon. Uh, there is a narrow band of about 40 miles across that cuts through the United States where you can see totality. People in other parts of the United States will only see a partial eclipse. So if you want to see that full eclipse, you have to make sure you're somewhere along that path. And if you go and Google the 2017 solar eclipse, I think you'll easily find a bunch of links that will take you to maps that show you where that line is going. And there are several strategies you can employ when photographing the eclipse. You can zoom in with a telephoto lens and just take a photo of the sun itself. Uh, and of course, you want to be very careful about this. Uh, especially with a telephoto lens. A telephoto lens acts like a, a giant magnifying glass. So if you were to point your telephoto lens at the sun uh, during the middle of the day when the sun is bright for longer than a few seconds, it will burn through your sensor, your mirror, it'll burn through the back of your camera. Your camera will explode on fire. So you never want to point, uh, especially a telephoto lens, at the sun. So I think the only time you can really photograph the eclipse is when it enters into the eclipse enough that the intensity of the sun is down so that you don't have to worry about burning through your lens. I mean, I use my telephoto lens to photograph the sun at sunrise and sunset, and the intensity is much less. You don't have to risk that. But during the middle of the day, uh, you know, burning the back end of your camera out is a real risk. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, you, can, you can shoot with a wider lens if you want to. And you know, I do wide angle photography into the sun all the time. Uh, at that point, the sun is such a small element of the picture that you don't risk burning your uh, sensor that way with a wide angle lens. So you have much more freedom and flexibility to, 
to shoot without worrying about it. Of course, you don't want to be staring into the sun, so you have to be careful about that because it could really hurt your eyes. So using live view for composition, I think, will help a lot to make sure you don't uh, you know, accidentally burn your eyeballs out. Um, so if you're shooting with a wide-angle lens, then you want to have some good scenery in the shot. And you know, I've been, I've been thinking about this myself a lot. I've been plotting the path of the totality and trying to figure out if there's a good place where I can have some scenery where the sun is going to be in a position in the sky at totality when it's in the full eclipse where I'm going to have some interesting scenery in the foreground that I could, I could work with. Now when it's in the full eclipse, things are going to get dark. It's going to look like twilight, so there might be some exposure issues there. I wish I, I wish I'd already photographed a solar eclipse. I never have. So this is going to be a learning experience for me. It's August 21st when this happens. And all I can, all I can say is um, uh, that, that all of us who have never photographed an eclipse will all be learning at that moment. I'm going to, I'm going to try to find a good landscape where I can use as a foreground uh, feature for a broader shot. I'm also going to bring my telephoto lens, so I'll be simultaneously shooting both the telephoto shot of the eclipse and, the, and trying the wider angle shot of the eclipse. Finding a, a place with good scenery is going to be difficult. I'm going to be exploring a number of locations that I've plotted along the path of the eclipse and see if they will work. The key determining factor is going to be the weather. So you obviously want to pick a place where it's going to be a sunny day because you don't want to risk missing the eclipse behind clouds. So I'm going to pick out a bunch of locations that I think look good. Uh, before the eclipse happens, I'll probably go spend a week driving along some of those locations, uh, exploring, looking for potential compositions. This is where something like an app like Photographer's Ephemeris can come in handy because you can figure out exactly when the eclipse happens, where the sun is going to be in the sky for any of these locations. So I'm going to be planning that as well. I'm going to be planning this to the greatest level of detail that I can. And once I've scouted out a bunch of potential locations, then I'm just going to check the weather forecast. And whatever place has the best forecast is the place I'm going to go. So that, that last day before the eclipse happens, I may be driving halfway across the country to go to one of these spots that I've scouted out. So the best I can offer you right now is some general tips and good luck. We have another live question from Tom. What are your preferred settings for Milky Way shots, like ISO, shutter speed, aperture, et cetera, et cetera? OK, so when you're photographing the Milky Way, I, I presume you mean you want to get what I call a static star field shot. So what you want to get is a shot where the stars uh, aren't moving around. They look like points of light. So when you do a long exposure at night, uh, the stars appear to be spinning across the sky. Actually, it's the Earth that's spinning, but the stars appear to be moving relative to our position as the Earth spins. So if you do a long exposure, the stars will be rendered not as points of light, but as streaks of light. So if you're looking to get that uh, point of light look, that static star field look, then what you need to do is have an exposure that's less than 30 seconds. Even at 15 or 30 seconds or 8 seconds, you'll see a little bit of streaking in the stars but it's minor enough that it won't be very evident. And the wider angle lens you use, the longer exposure you can get away with. So if you're shooting with a 50 millimeter lens, you probably don't want to have anything longer than 8 or 15 seconds. But if you're shooting with a 14 millimeter lens, you have a bit more leeway that streaking doesn't become that apparent. So I will often do 30 second exposures with my ultra wide angle lenses. So the stars are very faint. So you're going to want to let in as much light as possible. So usually, I tell people, shoot at your widest open aperture. So for most wide-angle landscape lenses, that's going to be f2.8 or f4. f2.8 is better. If you've got something that goes even wider, that's great. I know that Sigma, for example, is coming out with a new 14 millimeter lens that I think is a, a 1.4 or 1.2 lens. Um, if that's sharp at that wide open aperture, that might be a really fantastic night lens because it will allow you to let in a lot of light. But most wide-angle lens these days, is, these days have a maximum aperture of f2.8. Uh, so if you have that lens with a 2.8 maximum aperture, you're going to want to use that 2.8. Uh, in terms of ISO, uh, to let in enough light to, to really make the Milky Way stand out and the stars stand out, I'm usually shooting at a minimum of ISO 1600 or 3200. I don't like going up higher than that. Most cameras start getting really noisy when you do something higher than 3200. But 1600 or 3200 at f2.8, 30 seconds is usually the perfect settings to get that static star field look. 
Okay, we have another live question from Anya. Do you ever shoot in the rain? And if so, how do you protect your equipment from being ruined? Anya is always asking me about the rain. Uh, so <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I, yes, I do shoot in the rain. Um, if it's really heavy rain, that's usually not conducive to good landscape photography. Uh, but quite often conditions will be good if there's a light rain. And even a light rain, especially if there's a bit of a breeze, can, can be really difficult to work with. Uh, so usually wh what I would do in a situation like that is on occasion I've experimented with bringing a small umbrella and a, uh, and a small pliable clamp. So I connect the umbrella to the clamp and then I put the clamp on my tripod and I just put the umbrella over my camera while I'm shooting. It's better if you've got an assistant with you uh, and they can reposition the umbrella for you. But if you're working alone, having that pliable clamp is great because you can move the umbrella so that it covers the lens uh, but doesn't block the shot. Uh, if you don't have an umbrella, a lot of people will use like lens sleeves or, or other things to help cover their equipment. Uh, I tend not to use any of these things. Usually what I just do is I just shoot and, uh, and bring a bunch of dry cloths with me. So if, uh, I'll compose and if the lens get, gets wet while I'm composing, I'll quickly wipe it off and then I'll go ahead and take the shot really quick. More often than not though, when I'm shooting landscape, I tend to just wait for the rain to stop before I make the shot. It's, it's usually not the case that, that rain, the, the, the action of raining helps your landscape shots. The rain can be great because it can saturate the colors in your scene by making all that foliage nice and wet. It can be really great because it might, it might make the, um, all the rocks that were otherwise dry and bright and, and full of glare, it might make them nice and wet so that'll help make them darker and with a polarizer filter you can, you can really enhance the contrast in your scene. So the rain might make the landscape look better for you but the action of raining itself doesn't do much for your landscape photography. So I usually just keep my equipment in my bag, and then when the rain stops, that's when I take it out and make those landscape photos. Sometimes you can't avoid it, especially if you're trying to photograph rainbows. Uh, rainbows almost always appear when it's raining. Uh, that's what, you, know, I mean, you need moisture in the sky for a rainbow to appear. So uh, quite often you'll, you'll see a rainbow and it'll still be raining on you. So uh, in, in situations like that, I just, I just take my camera out. I don't even worry about the rain hitting it. I just uh, just always bring a lot of dry cloths and just keep that front element as dry as I can while I'm working and make the shot. Okay, and we have time for one more question here. Do you have to go to exotic locations to capture exciting and dynamic photos? This is a fantastic question. This is my favorite question so far. Uh, obviously, I spend a lot of time and effort going to exotic location uh, to shoot the photos that I want to shoot, but I I think the, the answer is no. You really don't have to go to exotic locations. I go to these places because I, I just want to travel to these places. They're, they're inspiring places, they're beautiful places, and I certainly encourage people to go to beautiful exotic places as much as possible. Uh, but obviously, not all of us have the time or the budget uh, to, uh, to do that. But you can make great photos anywhere. Now, it, it may be difficult if you're just trying to shoot landscape photography, depending on where you live, um, there might be some limitations to, uh, to what you can easily find close to you. Uh, but I think in general, most of the time, if you, if, you take, if you make the effort to get out and explore your local area, you'll be surprised. You'll see a lot of really beautiful things. Uh, so I, I live in Minneapolis, and most of the local scenery uh, isn't terribly exciting. It, you know, a lot of small hills and, um, and maybe some some lakes, small lakes and marshes. Uh, but even there, I mean, I'm able to find interesting things within my area and specific times of the year, some really interesting things happen, like some of the waterfalls that are in the area freeze over and you can get behind the falls and shoot through the ice and it can be really interesting. And all it takes me is a, a drive of a few hours to get up to Lake Superior or to go out to the Badlands in South Dakota, which is some really interesting scenery. And it may not be as exotic as when I go to Patagonia or Iceland or I'm uh, going to be heading out to the South Pacific to go to the island of Vanuatu and photographing volcanoes there really soon. Uh, so the scenery I can find in my local area may not be quite as, as exotic, but I still think you can make uh, wonderful photos. I, I started my career as a landscape photographer working on a book on the Chesapeake Bay when I was living in the Washington, D.C. area. And anyone who's been to the Chesapeake Bay knows it's pretty much as flat as you can imagine and for the most part, it's miles and miles of salt marsh. Uh, it's really a difficult landscape to, to photograph, but I embraced the challenge, and I had a, a really wonderful time making photos there.
And uh, if you can make good, if you can make great photos in scenery that's less dramatic and less exotic, uh, then when you do go to some place that's dramatic and exotic, you can make wonderful photos. So I think working in a place that's closer to home is really good learning. It's a really great way to learn the art of photography. And if it's less dramatic, that just makes it more challenging and all the more rewarding when you find something that's really great. So uh, we've reached the end of this session. I will, I'm looking forward to having another session with you guys. Thank you so much for all your wonderful questions. Once again, I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to everyone's questions, but we'll be doing a series of these live events and we'll be discussing a number of topics. So hopefully I'll be able to get to any further questions people might have in future events, but thank you for coming. Just a reminder, use the, uh, the Live 40 coupon code on the Outdoor Photography Guide shop to get my landscape photography videos and eBooks. I think that they cover a lot of the topics we discussed today in much greater detail. You'll find them to be very helpful. And don't forget to, um, to follow me and Outdoor Photography Guide on Facebook. And uh, just follow the articles. We have plenty of free articles and blogs with lots of useful information, lots of great free videos. Uh, so uh, just keep an eye out for all of that. And thank you very much for coming today. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks.